They say that trends change quickly, but then again, they also say that things never grow old. In this episode, we're exploring fashion and how Brummies dress to impress and how they've done so for as far back as the Anglo-Saxons on this episode of Birmingham Through the Ages. So I'm here at the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery to head into the Edwardian Tea Rooms where I'm going to have a chat with my colleague Layla Bell, who's a fashion influencer in her own right. So now we have a lot of online retailers and there's so many of them that you just get you get tabs on their websites that say new in this week, new in today and I know so many people that will constantly go onto the website and just click on what's new in today because they want the latest trends. Does that mean that everything that's happened last week and months before is that just completely irrelevant now? Or? Fashion is always in a loop and you can really see that coming here to the Birmingham Museum and Arts Gallery if you do visit the Dress of the Nines exhibition you can see how wonderful vintage is and the evolution of fashion itself. One of the things we're showing in the exhibition is the role that Birmingham played as a kind of shopping destination. Um, so we've got, for instance, a Sawa Kameez which was purchased on Soho Road, which is an area of Birmingham kind of really known for its shops selling South Asian fashions. Um, and we've also got an evening dress um, which was made by Anna Goodrick. Um, so that was a, a women's clothes and hat shop um, on New Street in the 1930s and 40s. And Dress to the Nines is about dressing up and going out from around 1850 to the present day. This is quite exciting because it's the first time in many years that we've actually had reasonable numbers of dress on display at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to actually see some of our collection which is, is normally in store. But it's also exciting because we're actually really looking for feedback from the public. Um, so we're wanting people to um, get involved by sending in photos of them dressed to the nines um, so that we have that more kind of lo local feel to it. Our collection doesn't really reflect um, the diversity of modern Birmingham and so we're, we're looking to um, expand our holdings and, and for people to donate new objects. So now we've come to Blakesley Hall to have a chat with Shirley to find out what fashion was like in the Tudor times. The house itself was built in 1590. It was built for a man called Richard Smallbrook. Um, Richard Smallbrook uh, was uh, trading in spices but he had his fingers in a lot of other pies and basically he wanted a house that shouted wealth and that's what he had. So he paid for this house, it's wooden built. Um, on the external you will see that there is so much wood in this building and that's how you judge what the man's wealth was like. Uh, the more wood there is in the building, the more wealthy he was. So can you tell me about fashion in the Tudor era? Well, what I'm wearing is basically I'm a maid. I'm the lowest of the low, so my clothes would probably have passed down to me from the lady of the house or from one of the other servants. Uh, very simple, a shift underneath. This shift I'm going to wear six or seven days without removing. Um, then over the top a kirtle, all hand stitched, always to the floor of course as well. We ladies are not going to show anything that we shouldn't. I'm not showing you what's right underneath because that would be rude. Because uh, ladies didn't wear any underwear. And then over the top an apron to protect the uh, thing and from somewhere for me to wipe my hands. And I'm wearing something on my head because I'm a married lady and I have to keep my hair covered. This is my crowning glory, it should only be seen by my husband. This is the simplest form of dress that you could get. If you are higher up in society, a bit higher than we are, quite often the lady of the house would be wearing something as simple as this. She is going to be working and what have you. But she would have uh, other clothing that she would wear if she was going out somewhere and wanting to impress. If you were a lady, um, sort of royalty level, the sort of clothing you're going to wear then, it was going to take you at least half an hour to dress. There are lots and lots of different types of clothing that, that certainly men would have wore depending on their level in society. Um, but generally speaking, women were triangular in shape when they were clothed and men were square. So, the poorer you were, the less likely you were to have anything. If you were very poor, I mean, if you were a servant, you considered yourself lucky because you, it was all found, basically, if you lived in. So you had a roof over your head, you were clothed, even if it was hand-me-downs, um, you were given a wage. Yes, you had to work lots of hours. I mean, 16 hour a day were, was the norm for, for a, 
for a servant. Things like jewellery, yes, we know that they wore them. The higher up you were, the more likely you were. So royalty definitely would have had um, gold and silver, pearls, rubies, you name it. They would have had all of that. Um, lots of royal Tudor women would have wore earrings and necklaces and such like. Um, very fancy as well usually um, and also they did wear rings when they married they wore rings but not necessarily a plain gold band um, so yeah they, they had that but it would be very much a, a, a class thing. Accessories are important and jewellery is a part of accessories so the clothing and then layering it with the jewellery, glasses, the hats, the scarves and things like that so mm -hmm. It is the layer, it's the cherry on top. If jewellery really is the finishing touch to any outfit, then that's something that I really need to learn more about. So, to find out more, I've come here to the Museum of the Jewellery Quarter. Well, this is a very, very unique place. We've got this completely uh, intact, abandoned Victorian jewellery factory. So many of the tools and bits of machinery and the handcrafting side of the trade are easily demonstratable to the public. We can bring to life the traditional handcrafting skills on the jewellers' benches. We can show you the mechanised side of the production. Uh, in front of the uh, visitors' very eyes, we can produce little articles which show that very, very quickly component pieces would be made. And we can show you the whole integrated process of this very uh, well-established jewellery firm. It was the factory of a firm called Smith & Pepper. Uh, they specialise in the production of gold and silver bangles and bracelets. One of the most successful pieces were bamboo bracelets. And of course we had this sort of connection internationally in those days to sort of exotic far flung, flung places. But also one of their major lines was snake jewellery. And the inspiration for that was the discovery of Tutankhamun. And after that there was a massive fashion internationally for uh, Egyptian inspired articles. So Smith & Pepper went into production, they produced um, uh, earrings and bracelets and necklets. And what we have currently uh, running in the museum for over a year now is a jewellery in residence scheme and they draw inspiration from Smith and Pepper's jewellery and from the machine tools you see all around the factory. The factory have got 7,700 sets of machine tools which would stamp out component pieces so it's 7,700 different designs and our jewellery in residence competition um, once they win they, they produced articles of jewellery based on Smith and Pepper's designs and our latest jeweller in residence is producing jewellery based on uh, Smith & Pepper snake jewellery. The Jewellery Quarter for over the last 150 years has been Britain's main centre of jewellery production. It overtook other centres such as Derby, Edinburgh, London mid 19th century uh, and it didn't stop there because at the end of the 19th century it was written that 90% of the jewellery retail establishments throughout the whole British Empire would be nonplussed if the Birmingham jewellery trade came to a sudden stop. It was selling far and wide right the way around the world. And then just before the First World War, for the number of people relying on this trade for a living, it was the largest single centre of precious metal working anywhere in the world. And it's still the largest cluster of manufacturers and retailers in Europe, producing about 40% of Britain's jewellery generally, but most of Britain's gold jewellery is still produced in the quarter. I love it here. It's great to learn about Birmingham in a museum that feels so alive, but we can't really talk about jewellery and ornamentation in the West Midlands without taking the trip to the Staffordshire Hall. So we have a reconstruction of the helmet pieces within the hoard, which visitors can see. And the exciting thing about that is it is such high status that we believe it would have been worn by a king. So one of the most important things from a fashion point of view is that this isn't jewellery, this is ornamentation. Obviously gold, silver was very popular, garnets were used as decoration, they clearly liked red. Um, and this is high status ornamentation, the ordinary Anglo-Saxon warrior was not wearing pieces as seen in the Staffordshire Hoard. Yeah. This was making a fashion statement. 